brothers and sisters in the struggle for human dignity and freedom. I am here to represent the struggle that has gone on for 300 or more years, a struggle to be recognized as citizens in a country in which we were born. I have had about 40 or 50 years of struggle, ever since a little boy on the streets of Norfolk called me a nigger. I struck him back, and then I had to learn... I had to learn... I had to learn that hitting back with my fist one individual was not enough. It takes organization, it takes dedication, it takes the willingness to stand by and do what has to be done when it has to be done. It has to be it. A nice gathering like today is not enough. You have to go back and reach out to your neighbors who don't speak to you. And you have to reach out to your friends who think they are making it good and get them to understand that they as well as you and I cannot be free in America or anywhere else where there is capitalism and imperialism until until, until, until we can get people to recognize that they themselves have to make the struggle and have to make the fight for freedom every day, in the year, every year, until they win it. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Burn It Down with Kim Brown, an appropriate start to the program. Would you say that was Mother Ella Baker, the mother of the civil rights movement, born December 13th, 1903 in Norfolk, Virginia. She passed away the same day in 1986. And in those years, Mother Ella Baker was a a rocket. You want to talk about burn it down, okay? <laughs> like the Ella Baker is who burn it down aspires to be. She was the lead uh, organizer and activist in organizations like the NAACP, the SELC, and of course, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, legend, GOAT, Titan. Did you see her like trying to quiet the kids? Like everybody was cheering. She's like, shut up. I'm, I'm trying to finish. I'm, I got these jewels. I'm trying to drop on y'all today. Um, and that's perhaps what we're going to do today, everybody. First of all, I love to see all y'all smiling faces in the place. Thank y'all so much for being here. Shout out to everyone that is in the chat. Please drop your comments, questions, your concerns, all of that. Please, please, please. And um, they might yell at me if I don't remember to tell you all this, uh, but follow the show if you can on Twitter at burn it down KB. And we have a Patreon. Hey, we got some new patrons. Hey, hey, Molly Shaw. Molly Shaw is handling the social media for us. Molly, if you are able, honey, if you have a few minutes, would you be able to, to make a quick list of our new patrons and hit me in the Slack? Because I would love to give them shout outs because Clearly, I'm trifling, <laughs> and and I had to get outside today, y'all. It was gorgeous uh, today in the DMV, but I digress. So um, today's show um, is actually good stuff. Not to say we don't do good stuff any other time, but today really in, in, an exceptional program for y'all today. Okay, have y'all heard of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights? Chances are, if you're watching this show, you have. Chances are. You might live in a place where the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights is totally a thing. And chances are, you may not know that the LEOBR had its unhumble beginnings here in the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland was the first state to enact the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights back in 1974. Well, as a result of incredible organizing, um, pressure, um, but cooperation, um, from some of our elected officials here in the state of Maryland on the local level who understand uh, that po police violence and police brutality is a, a, a public health danger to us all. And police officers cannot be exempt 
from legal consequences simply because they wear the uniform and carry the badge. So this year's Maryland legislative session, there has been a bill introduced in both the Senate and the House to repeal, repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. This is major shit, people. I hope y'all understand this. Um, we're going to talk to the delegate, the state delegate, who introduced the, the draft bill into um, the, the Maryland General House body. <laughs> um, Gabriel Acevedo represents Montgomery County. He's a Democrat. Um, his, his district is Montgomery Village. Uh, very diverse place. Montgomery Village is lovely, but, it, but it's very diverse. So just so y'all understand, like, Representatives who come from black and brown place, places are are understanding the, the 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 consequences of police not being held accountable. Speaking of holding police accountable, if you watch the show, chances are you were also a viewer of the police accountability report. I can't remember where it airs somewhere, but anyway, it's an awesome show. I'm sure you have watched it. Host. Taya Graham and her reporting partner, Stephen Janus, are going to join us on the second half of the program because they have a brand new documentary out. I watched it this morning. It's called The Friendliest Town. It's on Amazon. It's on YouTube. It ain't free. You know what I'm saying? Give it up for the people. <laughs> but you can rent it for like $4.99 or you can buy it for, I think, $12.99. Worth it because it is a compelling story about the first ever Black police chief hired in this very small town on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, and the end result was his attempts at community policing were rebuffed by the white power structure. There was a long court battle where they were trying to charge him criminally, effectively rendering him unemployable, I guess, as a member of law enforcement. Uh, but he was later exonerated. And come to find out, Stephen Janis was also the target of a, a bad prosecutor um, who was trying to silence the, the very diligent and amazing journalism uh, that both he and Taya Graham were able to report about what happened to Kelvin Sewell. It's called The Friendliest Town. That's going to come up later in the show. Um, so be before we hop into the law enforcement officers, Bill of Rights repeal, woo! conversation. I want you guys to check out this video that the ACLU of Maryland just put out just today. Um, and it features a woman who whose family has been on the receiving end of police brutality and police murder with no accountability. And she goes into detail about why this law, repealing of this law is so vitally and crucially important to Black and Brown communities. Brother Tunde, if we could. I care about police reform because I believe that the way how the system is structured today, that it is not helping the, the Black or the Latino community, it is hindering it. My name is Tracy Shands. I am Leonard Shands' sister. My brother on September 26th was at a Starbucks. The police pulled up and wanted to speak with him and he didn't know why they wanted to talk to him. My brother's afraid of the police because of what happened back in 2018 when an officer stabbed him and then got away with it. So they continue to um, go after him, meaning harass him and keep going at him. They pulled out guns. He started walking away from them basically yelling for 99% of the time of before he was actually shot down and killed. Um, he was yelling that they're trying to kill me. Y'all tried to kill me last year, 2018, Officer Whiting tried to kill me. And now y'all come back again to try to hurt me now. The police um, killed my brother on September 26. They actually threw a flash, a flashbang towards him. And as he went to move out of the way of the flashbang, he didn't even take a step. And they ended up firing over 44 shots into his body, killing him. He, it was not even a second that went by before they started shooting. He did not even, like he picked up a foot, but he couldn't even put the foot down before they started shooting him and murdered him. It, it hurts. It hurts to know that they'll do that to him the way they did it. The, the way how the law was displayed or, or taught to me, you know, I don't think it should have went the way how it went. And I don't think what's happening now should, should be going, it should be happening. Repealing the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights will allow law officers to be held accountable for the crimes that they commit. The, the old saying, 
law enforcement officers are nothing but criminals with a badge. The way how the Bill of Rights is structured, they are proving that to be a fact. It's basically on protecting the police officer when they have committed a crime. And they, I mean, there's just so many loopholes for them to get out of accountability of their actions. At the end of the day, if I commit a crime and I get charged for that crime and I get punished for that crime, it stays on my record for a lifetime. When law enforcement officers commit a crime, there's a 50-50 chance that they're going to get away with it. And even if they are punished, they can still get it expunged and go on and still get another job at another um, um, police station or department. So to me, I think that the um, the Leo Bray kind of put stipulations in there to save the officers from punishment. Lawmakers, if you do not repeal the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights and also change the five police reform bills, I, I honestly feel that you're not looking for peace in the community. I'm going to feel that you are a threat to the community. And I want the community to know that if we have law enforcement officers patrolling our streets and they are a threat to us, then we have to do everything in our power to protect ourselves from this threat. Because now we have, we have been raised to believe that police officers are supposed to be the good guys. But it is turning around now to show us that they're not. Change the laws, repeal um, the, the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights and get rid of it. And let's move forward and work together to build a better community. As I said, um, that video was made by the ACLU of Maryland. They just posted that today. And y'all, while Tracy Shan was talking, I Googled her brother. And I just realized that this is the same police involved shooting that happened in my community near Hyattsville, Maryland. This happened near the mall at Prince George's. And when, when she says that they shot her brother 40 times, she was a hundred percent correct about that. I believe it was at least four different jurisdictions came to the scene to, to deal with, with her brother. And they fired so many shots. Errant shots were, were actually penetrated um, windows of area office buildings. Like they were shooting waywardly. Um, and if you don't believe me, Google it. Like I know News 4 uh, here in DC did a story about that and were interviewing people who were in proximity of the shooting who said that they had bullet, bullets flying through their office windows. So it goes to show you how much the police were concerned about public health. Um, but now I'd like to bring in our, our guest and I'm very excited to have him joining us today because um, this is big news in the state of Maryland. It should be big news um, everywhere. But we are joined today with state delegate Gabriel Acevedo, he's a Democrat. He represents Montgomery Village in Montgomery County, Maryland. And um, State Delegate, thank you so much for making some time to speak with us. Ooh, I can't hear him, Tunde. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you, thank you again for making some time. So, so let me just jump right into it. So we have um, the bill being introduced in the Senate by um, State Senator Jill Carter, and you introduced it in the House. What exactly does the law enforcement officers' Bill of Rights repeal bill law potentially, what, what does it all encompass? Yeah, so I think it's important to uh, provide a little bit of history about the LEOBR. Thank you. Uh, so it provides greater context as to why we're advocating for its repeal and why its repeal is critical to the kind of uh, reimagining of public safety that we often hear uh, from uh, people in positions of power. Um, and so Maryland was the first state uh, to pass a law enforcement officer's bill of rights. Uh, I would argue we were the first state to provide America with the blueprint on how to protect corrupt and racist cops. Uh, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights was passed in the early 1970s. And in essence, what it is, it is a law, it is a statute that provides procedural protections 
uh, well above uh, the rights and protections that you and I have uh, as everyday Marylanders. Um, and it provides that kind of uh, protection and insularity for officers who um, are accused of misconduct and abuse. Uh, and this statute has long impeded accountability. It has long impeded oversight um, and has long impeded justice for victims and their families. And so my bill that I filed uh, along with uh, Senator Jill P. Carter from Baltimore City uh, would in essence fully repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Um, but let me just say, Kim, that while repealing the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights is critical, um, I want everyone to know who, um, uh, who are tuned in and who will tune into your show um, to watch this episode. I mean, if not for me for um, or the issue, but for Ella Baker, right? I mean, a brilliant uh, organizer. Um, and uh, it was just so amazing that you all just started the program with her because that's the kind of a fire that we need around police transparency and accountability to ensure that we get the kind of a changes that impacted communities victims and their families, like uh, the sister that was testifying about her brother being shot uh, 40 times. I remember that case. Um, and what we know is that police understand and know how to exercise restraint. They just choose not to use it or to exercise restraint when it comes to us. And so while it's important for us to repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, as we saw in that case, we need to ensure that we have a statewide use of force standard uh, where there's criminal liability for the officers who violate that use of force standard. Uh, we not only need to repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, but we need to pass a, an, another legislation that Senator Jill P. Carter and I also introduced, and that is Anton's Law, House Bill 120 and Senate Bill 178. Um, and all of these are really complementary legislation. And while everyone's focus is on the LEOBR and rightly so, because it does impede accountability and oversight and protect corrupt and racist cops, there are other important uh, pieces of legislation that we also need to pass in order for um, uh, police, our police reform efforts to really be meaningful. I'm so glad that you mentioned Anton's law and I wanted to, to circle back to the, the the importance of Anton's law and what it does to try to establish legal police transparency um, for, for people who have been harmed or murdered by police officers here in the state of Maryland. But I, I wanted to get your reaction, Delegate, if we could, um, from what the Fraternal Order of Police of the state of Maryland um, have had to say in response to um, this law that has been um, introduced in, in this year's legislative session. Um, Tunde, if we could, I wanted to go to, um, I, know, I know you're in Montgomery County. Maybe you've heard of this uh, Baltimore area radio show, but it's WBAL radio. Uh, the, the gentleman who hosted, his name is uh, Clarence Mitchell IV. He's a former um, state delegate, actually, or state senator. And the, the Mitchells are, are, are a long established like black political family in Baltimore, but the show leans a little conservative because uh, the the entire radio station basically is, is you know cop apologist. But they had um, the president of the Maryland FOP on, and we're asking him, I think, reasonable questions, perhaps not vigorous questions. But I want us to take a listen, y'all, and and get comfy because this is like three minutes. Because I wanted to play this in, in full context just to give some idea of what the police are saying in, in response to this, because they are less than pleased. Uh, so, Delegate, if you could sit sit tight for a second. Tune day, if we could get that clip from the C4 show. It provides a police officer uh, that has a uh, allegation against him to have a fair trial. That's it. Uh, it doesn't prevent the officer from being terminated. If you And it's no different than, um, I'll give you uh, an example to draw a parallel, um, uh, C4. You, you have in the military, uh, military men are judged by men in uniform. Um, doctors are judged by doctors. So the LEOBR allows for police officers of equal rank and above rank uh, to sit in judgment uh, to see whether or not a reasonable police officer would have done the same thing if confronted with the same circumstances. But wh why are police officers different than any other government employee when it comes to investigations? Five days you have to wait until questioning for a police officer for misconduct and in internal affairs. Why are police different from other government so, employees? And, and, and 
And Brian, to to your point, um, back in 2016, um, prior to 2016, um, when we had House Bill 1016 introduced, it was 10 days. Um, So I'll give you an example. Um, Police chiefs, the last person that they want to talk to is the police officer accused of of misconduct. That's the last person you want to talk to. So I think, you know, if you get into the the meat and potatoes of it, um, to say an officer has five days, you know, Right now, if there's a use of force situation, the officer has to give a statement before he leaves work that day. You know, he has to give a statement that day. So the police chief can order the officer to give a statement right there on the scene. But the police chief will not do that. But they won't tell the public that they don't want to do that because you only get a one shot to speak to that person. And you want to make sure that they are the last person that you talk to. So the minimum of five days, um, yeah, it, it looks different or it looks difficult on paper. Um, but for investigative purposes, the police officer is the last person you want to talk to. Now, uh, once again, President of Maryland Fraternal Order of Police, Sergeant Bo- Claire Boatwright, you know, it's one thing to be technical like we're doing right now with you and the Q&A, but perception, as you and I both know, is what's driving a lot of this. And the perception is, as Brian said, that there's a level of protection police officers enjoy that nobody else really enjoys. How do you remove that perception? Because right now, if you don't, it's difficult to get support. Well, so C4, to, to answer your question, if we repeal the LEOBR without having a due process right in place, you will now have 140 different discipline pro- processes throughout the state. And we're now going back to pre-1974 days, where the police chief has unfettered um, um, control over the investigation, who he investigates, who he doesn't investigate, um, who he fires, who he doesn't fire, he or she, you know, they, they have full control over that. So what we're saying from the LA, uh, from the from the FOP is that we want to have a due process right in place. You know, if you want to change the name of it from the Bill of Rights to to something else, then fine. Uh, we, we're okay with that. The problem that we have with this whole process is that when you talk about reform, um, when you get into criminal justice reform or, or social workers um, reform, mental health reform, people that have a stake in, in that are, are at the table and they are part of the process. Uh, for us, from the FOP standpoint, some legislators have decided to drop bills without even including us in the process. So if you're going to have police reform, why not have the police at the table right. to help you craft that legislation to say, hey, this is well, where, you know, where we're trying to go with it. And that has not happened. I mean, and, and that's an unfortunate uh, piece because now you you throw all kinds of other things into this uh, proposed legislation. Talk, you know, and it's as a result of things that happen nationally. You're talking about no-knock warrants. Um, you're talking about, you know, the chokeholds and things like that. Um, if you look at right now in, in, in House Bill 670, you'll have uh, police officers will have to serve warrants between, you know, 7 a.m. And, and 5 p.m. or something crazy like that, <laughs> where it limits the ability of how police officers to actually do the job. Um, so, uh, you know, we're saying let us come to the table. Let us be a part of the reform. We're not against reform, but we want sensible reform because it will lead to unintended consequences. Uh, they are the president of the Maryland Fraternal Order of Police. Delegate Acevedo, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to some of the things that he said, because he said quite a bit. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear police talk about no knock warrants and no chokeholds and only being able to serve warrants between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. Like it's a bad thing. Right. Um, but what about some of the, the issues that he raised? Let's start with um the, the, the lack of due process, as he put it, that the FOP was not part of this reimagination of repealing of the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. Were, were police involved in, in these discussions, to your knowledge? Yeah, so I think it's really ridiculous on its face that um, the president of the Maryland Fraternal Order of Police uh, would uh, say or even suggest that uh, we in no way uh, welcome them uh, at the table uh, to have a discussion about police reform. In fact, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, along with a number of organizations and associations, uh, have had multiple opportunities in order to work with us and testify uh, before uh, the House uh, Work Group on Police Accountability in Maryland that was established last year by Speaker Adrian Jones. Uh, that I was honored to be appointed to. And this work group was charged with a number of responsibilities. uh, And we really took uh, our time uh, and we really listened to all of the stakeholders involved from law enforcement to 
um, uh, advocates to uh, victims, their families, um, advocacy groups, subject matter experts in a number of areas. And ultimately what the work group did was voted to recommend uh, for legislation a number of things, a number of things that are now uh, reflected in quite a few bills that have been introduced to include the speaker's bill, House Bill 670, um, but also uh, my bills, House Bill 151, which is the full repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, but also House Bill 120, which is Anton's law uh, that seeks to reform the Maryland Public Information Act to ensure that there is greater transparency and that police misconduct records uh, are public. Uh, and so we've met with a number of folks. Uh, and I think it's important to say that since this law has passed um, in the early 1970s, there have been a number of people from advocates to victims and their families that have weighed in over the years, that have trekked to Annapolis, our state capital, that have for a number of years called for the repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. There have been legislation that have been introduced prior to me being elected to the House of Delegates uh, that would have either reformed or repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. So this is a long um, uh, uh, discussion that's um, uh, uh, been had in the General Assembly that the FOP has had several opportunities to weigh in on. Uh, but the reality is, is that the Fraternal Order of Police historically uh, has been opposed to any and all kind of a police transparency and accountability legislation. And we see that at the national level, uh, we see that at the state level, and we see it at the local level. Uh, they are not interested uh, in having uh, a real discussion about police reform. Uh, and, and, and if you look at their actions, they suggest otherwise. At the federal level, the national FOP has pushed for a similar bill like the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights at the national level that would have been detrimental to the kind of a transparency and accountability that we're talking about. The FOP has advocated for LEOBR in other states since Maryland uh, passed it. Uh, the, uh, the FOP has been advocating for um, you know, less civilian oversight, less transparency. So it is one thing to say something, but ultimately your actions are what uh, uh, are really saying whether you're interested in real police reform or not, and that's just not the case. I also want to touch on something that he mentioned around due process rights uh, and providing law enforcement officers with due process rights. So let's be clear. If we were to repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights tomorrow, law enforcement in the state of Maryland would have the same due process rights as any other state and local public employee. I'll say that again, if we were to repeal the LEOBR, law enforcement officials in this state would have the same due process rights as all other state and local public employees. And this is not something that the FOP would publicly acknowledge or any police chief or sheriff quite frankly, because they know the answer to that question is yes. And what that exposes is that we do not in fact need the LEOBR, that this instead is a statute that was passed to pro provide procedural protections and privilege for law enforcement that insulates them, that protects them from the kind of accountability and justice that communities have been calling for for far too long. And so this bill needs to go uh, and we also need to ensure that we're passing things like Anton's law that would reform the Maryland Public Information Act. Let me just say really quickly that recently Goucher College in Baltimore uh, conducted a poll on police reform. Uh, uh, and it showed that, um, among other things, that 87 percent of Marylanders support making police misconduct records public and maintaining a database of police misconduct cases. 87 percent of Marylanders. That is exactly uh, what Anton's law would accomplish when passed. So 87% of Marylanders technically support Anton's law pass, um, the, the, the passage of Anton's law. It is complementary legislation. We need to get it done. Uh, and the FOP needs to be serious about police reform because they're not, because they're saying this uh, on these various talk shows and programs. And when you look at their testimony in Annapolis and you've looked uh, uh, at what they've said around uh, these really important bills that we're pushing, it just completely suggests otherwise. It's time for the LEOBR repeal to um, uh, the LEOBR to go. It needs to be repealed. 
uh, and the people we should be listening to are the people most impacted. For the same reason we don't ask perpetrators of domestic violence to then craft public policy on domestic violence, we should not be asking perpetrators of police violence to then craft public policy on police accountability. Interesting. Also, uh, Sergeant Boatman said quite seriously uh, to, to the radio host there that, come on, military men investigate military men. Uh, you know, other other people in different professions investigate themselves. The police have shown us time and time again, while they are not to be trusted, um, investigating officers other officers, you know, like themselves with uh, who have been accused of wrongdoing or even worse, heinous murder. Um, but, but delegate, before I let you go, um, I, I did want to ask about the the amount of support um, that this bill has uh, in in the state uh, in the general assembly. What is the likelihood that it is going to get passed? In your opinion. Well, support has grown over the years for Anton's law. This is uh, the third time that I am introducing uh, this bill that would reform the Maryland Public Information Act. Um, uh, and support has only grown for it. Uh, I am uh, certainly optimistic, but I also recognize that uh, the building that each and every single day that I go to uh, to represent my constituents in District 39, that includes Montgomery Village, but also Germantown, Clarksburg, Washington Grove, uh, and Gaithersburg, uh, every single day uh, I walk into that building, I understand that that building uh, runs uh, on political will. Uh, and whenever political will isn't there, the will of the people must be present. And so equally as important to me um, advocating for the bill and convincing my colleagues, we need folks uh, uh, in the public, we need those folks who were marching in the streets, who were taking a knee, who were um, uh, 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 showing up for racial justice, who were demanding change. Now is the time to channel that energy into legislative advocacy. We need to go from protest to policy, and we need to be supporting these types of a legislation like Anton's Law, like the full repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, like a statewide use of force standard with criminal implications for officers that violate that, 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 that standard or policy. We also need independent investigations and prosecutions, which is a huge issue uh, as it relates to police accountability, because what we know is that our criminal legal system declines to prosecute 97% uh, of, uh, of police um, uh, brut um, brutality and killings uh, and only 1% result in a conviction. And what that tells us is that victims and their families are, are, are not only being extrajudicially executed, but they are then not getting justice and not getting the kind of accountability from the courts that you would expect. And so there's some things we need to do there as well. And lastly, there's some things that we need to do around white nationalism within law enforcement. And that is really absent from the conversation about police transparency and accountability. We know that the inception of law enforcement in the law enforcement or policing in the United States uh, it comes out of white supremacy, it comes out of slave patrols, uh, and it comes out of white nationalism. And so that is the foundation of policing in the United States and the institutions that we see today, the law enforcement agencies come out from that. And so we really need to examine white nationalism. I will just share for uh, folks uh, you know, tuning into the show, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland, uh, uh, his subcommittee on civil rights and civil liberties recently uh, put out an unredacted FBI assessment uh, that talks about um, uh, and uh, speaks to the infiltration of white nationalism in law enforcement. And it is very, very concerning, uh, and we should all be paying attention, but also demanding, just as we're demanding changes to existing laws uh, and the reforming of existing laws, we should also be calling for uh, the rooting out of white nationalism within law enforcement so that we can see an end to the kind of a racialized policing that has really been America for so long. Mm -hmm. You know, Delegate, I mean, many organizers and activists that I've, I've spoken with over the past couple of years it would definitely um, uh, agree that, that the reform is absolutely necessary, especially for accountability. But when it comes to rooting out white nationalists and white supremacists from law enforcement, how can you root them out of something that they founded, something that they created? They have been there since its inception. 
um, the, the, the framing of they infiltrated it is something that I, I personally take issue with, not issue with you because you did some awesome things <laughs> in the state well, well, house, the but title. at the same time, that, we have to examine the roots yeah. of policing. Do we not? Yes. That's that absolutely. And that's the title of the report, by the way, right? Those aren't my words, but just so that, you know, if folks want to do, um, um, some, some of their own homework, you know, to, 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 to check out the report, uh, it speaks to the infiltration of white nationalism, uh, in law enforcement in the United States. But uh, this is very urgent, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what we know is that this is an issue that for far too long, uh, black and uh, brown people in this country, but particularly black people uh, have been bringing to public attention. This is not um, you know, new. Police violence is not new to American public discourse. Black people have been having this um, uh, discussion and have been uh, uh, pushing people in power for a very long time, whether we're talking about Ida B. Wells, who risked her life um, so many times to report about uh, cases of police violence in the South to, you know, in the early 1920s and 30s, um, where there was movement uh, around ending police violence after the destruction of Black Wall Street, which was Tulsa Police Department in collaboration with the KKK. We see people like uh, Paul Robeson and the Civil Rights Congress that issued a report um, back uh, in the 1950s titled We Charge Genocide, and they presented it to the United Nations, basically documenting instances of police violence against Black people in this country uh, from 1945 to 1951. You know, we talk about Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech a lot, right? But we don't talk enough about a portion of his speech where he says that, you know, as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable police violence in this country, we cannot rest. We don't we don't talk about that. Right. You know, but we focus on, you know, where, you know, he talks about his dream and what he would like to see America become one day. But that's an important piece as well. You know, we fast forward to the 1970s and 80s. We see organizations like the Black Panther Party where one of its expressed goals was ending police violence against Black people in this country. We go, you know, fast forward to the 80s and 90s, whether it's uh, the brutalization of, 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 of Rodney King or the killing of Amadou Diallo, to the mid-2000s, to the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Black people have been doing this for far too long. And we need to get to a point where people in power are stopped engaging in pandering and performative wokeness as it relates to police transparency and accountability and getting these policies that are rooted in our community, right? Those closest to the pain are closest to the solution, but seldom are they closest to power. And so what we have a responsibility as elected officials uh, is to listen to those who are impacted. And if you listen to that sister who was sharing the pain about seeing her brother being shot 40 times and knowing the solutions to that, and that certainly is ending the law enforcement officer's bill of rights. It's a use of force and it's a number of other things, but we have to be serious. My party, the Democratic Party, often talks about, um, you know, just uh, how important black women are and how important black voters are um, as a constituency to the party. Well, I'm here to say that, you know, black people's love language is policy and we have to get serious. And what that means then is really engaging with the policies that we're saying would bring about safety and would reimagine uh, reimagine public safety. And let me just say this real quick and I'll end that you hear folks say a lot about reimagining public safety and as a people and as a community, we shouldn't be getting too caught up in, 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 in folks using these slogans and then on the back end, not really doing anything meaningful to change the way policing is done in our communities. And so reimagining public safety must mean transparency. And that's what we're pushing for with Anton's law. And it must mean oversight accountability and control over the way public safety is administered in our communities. And this is not a radical idea. Homeowners associations do this. And so we are saying this is what reimagining public safety looks like in our community and we can get it done. Let's get it done. We've been joined with state delegate Gabriel Acevedo representing Montgomery County. Delegate Thank you so much for your fire, your passion, your work, and for making some time to share with us this important piece of legislation, which I absolutely hope passes and repeals the LEOBR in the state of Maryland. Thank you once again. Thank you. All right, guys. Hey, um, 
I see the comments are on fire. <laughs> uh, before we bring Stephen and Taya on, let me run through some of these comments because John Viev has been dropping them in here like hot cakes. Um, special thanks to, to Delegate uh, Acevedo for joining us. Liu Kang, what's up, Liu Kang? I saw you in the clickbaity chat that day. I didn't, I just, I was big stoner. Forgot to shout you out. Liu Kang says, I still don't understand why body cams can even be controlled by the officers. Hello, it should activate once their shift starts and until their shift ends outside of breaks, et cetera. Hey, there's been a lot of, um, th 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 thank you, Luke Hank, for the comment. There's been a lot of proposed like techie solutions to, you know, something that Lou raised in terms of body cams. Like, first of all, they should not be able to turn them on and off. Um, but also like, if you're, if a cop is trying to like unholster his gun, like there should be like a signal or something like that sent to the precinct, letting them know that this officer has unholstered their gun. I mean, that way, cause I mean, how many cops just try to intimidate and threaten people by pointing guns at them, whether or not they mean to shoot them or not. Um, Nestor Gonzalez says, Maryland has been the master of hiding police crime, man. Listen, what I keep trying to tell y'all, Maryland is not as progressive as advertised. Uh, it votes blue, but you know, the policies not not really that blue um deep moody purple blues says they are an occupying army against we the people yeah and and we pay for them and not only do we pay for them we pay for them when they fuck up right um it is taxpayer dollars that largely pays out these police um police settlements alicia what's up alicia alicia says that shit needs to be repealed now hey they got, they actually have some political will right now. Um, pardon me, the delegate was actually 100% correct about that. There is more will in Annapolis now than has maybe ever been, pardon me for burping, um, <laughs> for, for, for that to be passed. So it's awesome. Schulte 100 says, seems like a no brainer. Let's see some democracy take place around Anton's law. Let's go, man. Hey, y'all know who's standing in the way. Um, but I think this is why it's so important, by the way, y'all, for, for you to act. I mean, I'm not, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know y'all know what time it is, but new niggas who might not know what time it is. Like, this is why, like, you have to really be engaged at the local level, because that is where shit changes. Like, we can't look to Congress to change and do major shit, because Congress, that's not their priority. They don't give a shit, okay? But your, your local delegate, your state senator, they are in a position to at least introduce things. Um, and, and, and push them along that, down that same path, hopefully to gain more political will and political support. But that's where the activists and the organizers come in to help apply, apply that public pressure on the public officials. So they get it right, man. We're not playing out here. Um, uh, today are Steven and Taya, are they here? <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Okay. All right, y'all. Oh, oh, real quick before I bring in Steven and Taya. Okay. We are still trying to find a name of what to call. Our, our, our merry band of, of awesomeness. I'm not calling y'all awesomeness, but so we're trying to figure out what to call people who, who like the show. So if you're a, if you're already subscribed to Patreon, you're going to get a chance to vote in a poll. But if you guys have more suggestions, I've seen um, the accelerants, <laughs> which I'm kind of fond of. And I also like the flames. Flames is very good. Um, drop your suggestions in the chat and we are going to give um, a poll on Patreon or something like that, <laughs> something along those lines. I digress. Let me bring in um, the, the amazing journalistic reporting duo um, uh, that, that is, that is my good friends, Taya Graham, the host of the P Police Accountability Report and her reporting partner, investigative journalist, Stephen Janis. Um, they are here to talk to us about their new documentary. It's called The Friendliest Town. Um, Steven and Taya. Oh, there's Taya. I'm so happy to see Taya's face. There's Taya's face. All right. Yes. Yes. Taya, I didn't forget. I didn't forget my last time, but we're not going to trip off old shit. You here today. So that's all that matters. I'm so happy to see you. Happy belated birthday. It's Aquarius season. Hey, Taya, everybody wish, wish Taya happy birthday in the chat, please. Taya just celebrated a birthday. She is 28. Can't you tell? Yes. <laughs> not a day over. And that, and you can tell, anyway, let me just be quiet. But I love Taya. Taya and Steven are two of my favorite people. So I'm very excited to say, Steven, you look great too. I'm just by oh, the way. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad so to see to you guys. Here. Um, I wanted to tell you, I was gonna text you earlier after I watched it, but I said no. I said, let me tell them 
um, in the moment while we're doing the show. Okay, so I watched the doc for the first time this morning. It was really, 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 really good. And what made it so good is that you guys told like a very layered and like almost complicated story. I mean, first of all, the storytelling was amazing. The cinematography was also quite gorgeous um, on, 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 the, on, on the documentary. So m very, very big, big high praise for me because I thought it was really, really good and really, really well done. So thank you, let me stop gushing. Let me calm down, okay. I wanna appreciate it. <laughs> thank, thank you guys so much for being on here. If you guys could um, give us, give us a, a, a synopsis of what The Friendliest Town is about and tell us who is Kelvin Sewell? Okay, well, let me start and then I'll hand it over to Steven. So The Friendliest Town is about this tiny little town on the Eastern shore of Maryland called Pocomoke City. Now this town only has about 4,300 residents in it and it's evenly divided between the African-American community and the white community. So we knew this Baltimore City police officer, Kelvin Sewell, who was leaving Baltimore City after 20 years as a homicide detective, going down to Pocomoke City to become their first black police chief. Well, Kelvin Sewell goes down there and he starts to institute what we always talk about, which is community policing. And so what he did was he actually actualized this. What he did was have his officers get out of their cars, walk, and talk to the people on the street, talk to residents. Sounds really simple, but it changed the community's relationship with the police department. So he had his officers get out and talk. He actually gave people his direct cell phone number, and he did another thing. Instead of just slapping cuffs on people, he decided to help them get jobs, get drug treatment, even get financial aid to go to school. So he took a completely different approach to policing, and as you can imagine, there eventually ended up being some pushback. So I'll hand it over to you, Stephen. Well, I mean, you know, so <clears throat> in 2015, which is when we really started covering the story, he was fired by uh, nearly all white city council without explanation. And so what became the thrust of the story were two things. One was everyone wanted to know why he was fired because he was extremely popular. And, you know, second, his firing prompted a rising consciousness of the African-American community in Pocomoke who said, you know what, we were happy with this chief and we're not going to take this sitting down. We're going to fight back. And of course, as you know, Kim, uh, the Eastern Shore is, it's night, well, is it 1950 or 1920? Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, is it yeah. 1950 or is it 1850? Right. Because there so, are a lot of Confederate flags down there. I think the white council was stunned and also really didn't know how to handle or what to do when the African-American community said, you know what, you can't do this to us anymore. And so that became the thrust of the documentary was, you know, on the one hand, what was going on behind the scenes to take Kelvin down. And number two, you know, what the community was doing to fight back and how that was sort of a new phase and chapter for the African-American community in Pocomoke. It was incredible. I mean, the, the doc, and again, like I, I was talking to y'all when you guys were going back and forth to Pocomoke and you guys oh, yeah. would be like, yeah, we're headed to Pocomoke. Like you guys are going back to Pocomoke again. <laughs> like, I know, guys, I know. <laughs> you guys yeah. spent so much time in Pocomoke. And just for context, for our, 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 our viewers who do not live in the state of Maryland, Pocomoke is far as shit from Baltimore. <laughs> it, what is it? Is it four hours? Is it? It's something it, ridiculous, right? It's three and a half hours one way. So it's not, you know, a, a, right. a quick jaunt. I mean, right. So basically, we would have seven hour round trips to go down to report. Yeah. And we went down to the Eastern Shore at least 40 times. And Kim, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said you like the cinematography because believe it or not, that was the first time that I had a camera in my hands and I shot about 50% of that movie. So mm -hmm. the fact that you liked it, Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. But no, it was gorgeous. I mean, gorgeous. M Maryland races to shit, but it's a pretty <laughs> thing in some places. <laughs> um, so, so, so Tunde, I, I want us to, to, to go to the trailer. Um, and again, you guys, it's called The Friendliest Town. It, it's on Amazon. It's on YouTube. I believe it's going to be some, some other platforms as well. But um, the, the trailer kind of gives us a, a bit of a glimpse as to how the black members of the community, um, as Stephen and Taya both mentioned, you know, felt about uh, police chief Sewell and, you know, how he was being railroaded. And when we come back, I want to talk to you about, I mean, so many echoes of like Jim Crow intimidation um, uh, against Chief Sewell and his family. And, you know, that the scene where he packed up, he didn't say he was packing up in the middle of the night. It sure looked like he was packing up in the middle of the night. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and really who can blame him? But um, 
Two day, if we could, let's check out the trailer for The Friendliest Town. Things became different once Chief Sewell came to Pocomoke. Um, we went to church together. His daughters and myself went to college together. He was African American too, and he was here in our community. Not only was he walking, he was like stopping and talking and intergaging with the kids. What happened was they started feeling like, okay, the police do care. We started hearing that the council was looking for ways to terminate Chief Sewell here in Pocahontas. When he started being called he complained. That's why Chief Sewell lost his job. They almost begged me to that I could get out of my situation by throwing dirt on one of them. It was a total awakening of the black community. The things that you've been doing for years, you can't do it anymore. We, we woke up. You know, we realized that there were things that were going on that we didn't necessarily approve of. You just go along to, to get along. And that's what we had done here in Pocomo. That's what the African-American community had done. We had just gone along to get along. There were a lot of things that we didn't like. But Chief Sewell was our person. Yeah. And, and, you know, without giving too much away, because there were some 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 legitimate like surprises um, in this. But I want to talk about the, the way that Chief Sewell and his family were, were targeted and persecuted, not only by the police in the area once they had. Well, I, I suppose the city council had fired him. He 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 was under surveillance. Um, yeah. He had to fight these bogus charges. And yeah. I mean, without a doubt, there was some malicious, intentional prosecution happening by David. What a villain's name, David. He just sounds like a jerk. Um, t talk to us about, about sort of like, I, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I can't describe it in any other way except like the Jim Crow stuff that Kelvin yeah. Sewell endured, um, both by the law enforcement and by the prosecutor's office. Well, you know, once. Kelvin uh, was fired and he, you know, alleged discrimination and filed the EOC complaints to the lawsuit. All of a sudden the state prosecutor's office comes down to Pocomo yes. and starts just looking for anything they can find. You know, one of the reasons we found out about it was because of a woman named Jerry Fitch who told us that they had asked her, you know, several times, hey, we can, um, you know, we can drop the charges if you just say you had sex with Chief Sewell. I mean, what is that reminiscent of, you know? And um, and then they finally settled on this 2014 accident that had occurred where a guy had run into two parked cars, driven three blocks home, called police. And they said, because Kelvin was in the same black Mason society as him, that it was corrupt, which was a total, absolute, utter misreading and misuse of the law. So it, it was like, they just were going to get him. You know, it's like, you're not going to come down to Worcester County and, and tell us that you're we're racist. We're going to teach you a lesson and we're going to teach everybody a lesson. And, you know, they, they were relentless because they tried him twice. So it, it was really very scary in a lot of ways that they were just whatever, as Taya said in the documentary, they were out to destroy him. And it's really hard to see this as anything other than a form of retaliation, because what what was the spark for this whole thing was that one of Kelvin's officers, uh, Lieutenant Savage, was invited to be part of the Worcester County Drug Task Force. Right. And he was going to be the first African-American ever put on that task force. And once he was there, his fellow police officers started texting him things like, what's your body count, my N? And they would do things like put uh, President Obama's picture with uh, superimposed over food stamps. Uh, they invited him to go to KKK Lane. And they took him to KKK. They, and they took him there. And it turns out that place actually exists. So they drove a black police officer and said, this is KKK Lane. This is where we used to hang people. So <gasps> what, as you can imagine, Savage filed an EEOC complaint. And once he did, he got a severed, bloody deer tail pushed on the windshield of his car. And that's and from that point on, he went to Kelvin and said, Kelvin, what do I do? And said, and Kelvin said, file your EOC complaint. And then that's when the intense mm. pressure started coming in on Kelvin because the city council was trying to force him to fire Savage. And, and Sewell said, of yeah. course, I can't do that. He filed an EEOC complaint. He's protected from being fired. And they're, you're trying to make me commit an illegal act. He refused. And then that's when Kelvin was fired. Yeah. And, you know, at the conclusion of the documentary, something that was really made very clear to me was the importance of independent media and journalists such as yourself to be there to tell the tale. Because I, I'm, I was looking at this and I'm like, 
if I thought that I was going to get the full story of what helped happen to Kelvin Sewell in Pocomoke and the subsequent prosecutions from the Baltimore Sun or from the Washington Post, they they were not able to give it the the, the depth and, and and fullness and and wholeness um, of the story that it really deserves. Because as you said, the the black community coming alive in in organizing um, around what happened to Kelvin and then taking it further um, was simply re- remarkable. And they credited you guys, and I want to credit you all for telling Kelvin's story. But it was a, a bigger story to be taken away from there. But it didn't come without some risk. Stephen Janice, I had no idea that that evil prosecutor Davitt convened an investigation about you. <laughs> you kept um, that nugget quiet during, during all this Pokemon well, uh, stuff. Uh, what was that like, Stephen and Taya, to, to be the targets of, of a, a state prosecutorial office who can who, who is free to fuck with you in, in, in ways, you know, un, until they get tired of fucking with you? Like, uh, what, what was that experience like? Well, you know, it was really weird because Kelvin's lawyer said, well, the state prosecutors are going to show up at your house. It could yeah. be at your house. It could be at your work. You, I said, what do you mean? You know, they could, they could show up at any time. There's no telling. So like for weeks, you know, I would look out the window and be like, when are they going to get here? You know, because it, it, it was like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And, you, and you know, I had to get a lawyer and, um, you know, I had to lawyer up and, and, and be prepared. And it was so shocking because really all we'd done is, is tried to interview somebody. Right. And um, so it was it was really kind of scary, to be honest with you. But it also was it really pissed me off and probably that's the worst thing to do. <laughs> probably one of the reasons that I finished this documentary with such a vengeance was that I was really, really angry about it, because to me, it was just like so blatantly, you know, just trying to silence the free press. And, and you know, first they're like, well, we're going to silence you know, any intimations of racism and then anyone who reports on it, we're going to silence them too. We're going to misuse the the resources of the state against it. It was, it made me so angry that I was just like, I'm going to finish this fucking thing. Excuse me for swearing, but I'm going to finish this Mm -hmm. because these people really, they really were going to come at me. So it was, it was a lot of fear that really turned into anger. Once I got over the fear of thinking I would be pulled into a grand jury or made to testify or, or even charge, you know, it just, it was unbelievable. It was, it was unbelievable. And I, and I just want to add, I'm, I don't say this to disparage local media down on the Eastern shore, but a lot of the local media there really missed the story. Uh, a lot of them just took whatever press release was given by yeah. the mayor's office and put that as print or use that in their story. And they really didn't dig any further. And as you can imagine, you, you know, we're reporters from Baltimore City coming down. And I remember a specific incident when we first went down there where a guy came up to me and he said, you're media. And I said, yes. And he said, I don't want you to turn this into another Baltimore or another Ferguson. And I was like, well, mm. that's not... Thank you for thinking I have that kind of power, but that's not what the media does. I'm here because the story's here and the racism is here. If that wasn't here, I wouldn't have anything to report on. I, one one more question, and I'm gonna let you guys go because you know, I I, I was concerned for the two of y'all for your safety. Um, you, you know, like far out areas, even in so-called progressive Maryland, you know, we refer to them as clan country, like Pocomo absolutely qualified as clan country. And you are um, an interracial reporting team. Um, What were some of your experiences, if you had any, uh, with people saying like racially sideways shit to y'all while you were working on this super important story? Or you can sure well, I, I was gonna I was gonna mention the little yeah. she, do you want me to tell her about the ribs or oh, oh yeah, or- well we can talk about the <laughs> Oh my god, that was so funny. Yeah. Well Okay, so we're down there where you know we order some food, we're hungry, we've been reporting all day, and they We and- came in, we went into the restaurant, we ordered it, and then we left. And, and then I came back. And everything was ribs. No, well they gave me ribs. <laughs> I had ordered salmon. You have to explain it. We had ordered salmon. Yeah. I had ordered fish and, and I had this big box of ribs and I called him and I said, hey, you gave me ribs. <laughs> I didn't order. He goes, well, just eat them and hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the funny thing. That was, then, the, fu- that was the funny thing. Then, but... then we saw, the, then like you'd be in the parking lot and we saw this truck with like a noose. With a li- it had a little Confederate flag and then it had a noose hanging from its rear view window. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, the first hotel we stayed in, these people had this huge Confederate flag and they're yeah. all sitting out drinking beers and like, you know, throwing. And of course, the police officers there, you know, they say, you know, 
be safe, or, yeah, drive or, home safe. And they would say it in a way yeah. that you knew they weren't really genuinely so we, concerned about our safety. You, you know how someone can kind of spin something that seems innocent, but make it sound real evil. And once we yeah. saw what they did to Kelvin on the justice and we started staying in um, Salisbury, Salisbury. Yes. Cause we didn't want to stay in Pokemon because we were just, people told us, you know, they could try to like, you know, People warned us. It. People yeah. warned us that the police might try to throw charges on yeah, us. Yeah, and and if you're in that justice system down there, you're and you're not part of that place, uh, you're do, you're done. There's no way you're going to get out of it. They'll they'll drag you down there and keep you down there for. So we we became very careful. And can I just add one thing for the white people there who stood up for Kelvin at first when Kelvin was first fired, the entire community showed up, white and black, saying, "Why are you firing this police chief? We really love how he's taking care of the community." By the second city council meeting a lot of the white people had disappeared. And it was almost as if they had been told, stay on your side, keep quiet. And the white people that continued to advocate for Sewell and became members of the Citizens for a Better Pokemoke, they both, the two of the women I'm thinking of, both experienced a lot of backlash and they eventually had to move out of Pokemoke. Hey Kim, did you like your role in it? That's right, we made sure you had, <laughs> you had you a starring there. role. I appreciate that. Listen, I was so engrossed in the doc when my face popped, I was like, oh shit, right, I am in this. They did tell me I was in this, but I'm like, well, I was actually smoking weed, but I mean, but I was <laughs> so engrossed. Like I had made some hot dogs and I wrote a big flat split and I'm just like watching this doc. It just in, in total amazement of, of you guys' storytelling ability and, and how um, compelling of a story it is. Folks, if you want to see, number one, that Black cops also do not have protection uh, from the system, this is a, a, a very uh, interesting oh. story to see about the levels of corruption, how far the white power structure will go, even in the 21st century, uh, to do away with any represent representative of, of someone trying to uh, achieve progress, at least in, in the realm of policing, policing in, in, in ways that, you know, Di disrupted the white the white supremacist structure down there in Pokemo. But I, I'm not going to hold y'all. I, I want to thank you both so much uh, for making some time. The, the duck us. is thank amazing. You. The friendliest town. It's on Amazon. It's on YouTube. Where else can people uh, stream it? iTunes, Vim, Vimeo. You know, it's like, you can also on Comcast On Demand. Comcast On Demand. Um, you just have to search it on your Comcast On Demand. All you have to do menu. is type in the friendliest town, yeah, and so you can get it Amazon, I'll, iTunes, most Comcast. Most places where you where you pay for video on demand, but we have a we got this distribution through Gravitas, so it's actually out there pretty well. So if people want it, um, you can get. It. And it's also on DVD. That's right. For people DVD, who want to go what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Um, so it's on DVD too, but you know, so it's all all over the place. Brilliant, brilliant. Amazing work, you two. Th Thanks thank you so both much. for making the time. We've been speaking with Taya Graham, the host of the Police Accountability Report, investigative journalist Stephen Janice, the friendliest town, folks. Stream it this weekend. It is dope, 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 dope. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and Taya. Thank you, Taya. Happy belated birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. Love you guys. Thank y'all so much. All right, y'all. It's, um, you know, I don't like to hold y'all in overtime too much. And here we are three after the hour. So let me get to these comments. Holy my golly. Look at all these comments upon comments upon comments. It's glorious. Glory, glory, glory. Where did I leave off at? Hmm. Afraid not in ratchet. You people have some names, some, some YouTube handles, don't y'all? Afraid not in ratchet says... FOP is untrustworthy. They cannot be trusted to self-regulate. What a joke, right? Did y'all hear Sergeant Boatman sounded like a whole ass fool on that damn radio show? I said, sir, be serious right now. Um, Microsoft Word technical support. What's up, Microsoft Word technical support? Um, they say that's not even true, though. They literally make that separate organization in the other area and the other area except the police. Fuck, I wish I'd have known exactly what you were replying to because I'm trying to I'm trying to put this in context. Yeah, um, yeah, no, the 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 FOP president of the FOP in Maryland was doing big line on the radio. Chuck Diesel, what a name. Um, at Schultzy 100, he was talking to you, Schultzy. He said, yes, definitely an excellent guest. He is very knowledgeable. Yeah, thank you so much to Delegate Gabriel um Acevedo. Um, represent Montgomery County. And you guys, all the areas that he listed off that he represents are very kind of different from one another, even though they're in Montgomery County, like, like in my perception of Montgomery Village anyway, 
like working class, but then some upper middle class too. But like Clarksburg, that's like mansions, big time mansions. I mean, but it's, it's Negroes out there. Nestor Gonzalez also back in the comments says that reporting is very important. It shows the mafia police don't want anyone trying to end its criminal way. They look at anyone doing that as Judas talking about what happened to Kelvin Sewell in Pocomoke City. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I watched the doc today. It's good. It's good. Try to watch it this weekend uh, if you're able, because it, it's totally worth it. Um, thank you again to Steven Natea. Thank you all for watching and chilling and shit. Um, hey, thank you, Molly Shaw, for, for um, compiling a list of all of our patrons. And I think this is everybody. <laughs> so I might start from the bottom and go up because I know I've, I've mentioned our, that's okay, fuck up. Everybody's getting a shout out. Let's go. Milton Munyer. What's up, Milton? What's up, um, my one box? My one box. <laughs> what box is that? See, you can't ask me about boxes because my brain goes to the gutter. Alicia, Mark Smith, MD. What's up, MD? I know you are you a stir crazy alum. What's up, Jay Beck, Meryl Sloan, Left Pocket Project, Wendy Muse. See, that's how sisters support sisters. Thank you so much, Wendy. Love you. Damian Smith, Al Gresniak, Marion Butcher. Nora, Black Magic, Catherine Osband, Emerging Translative Translators Collective. We got some other ones in there too. Yes, yes, I knew that. Yes. Okay, Justine Barron. What's up, Justine? Shinette, Samaya, Amatula Foster. Thank you so much, Samaya. Emily O'Brien, Sean, Michael Leroy, Sam Gardner, Marcus Gabriel, Caroline Lampion, Roy Woody. What's up, Roy? Talisha Conklin. Yes, what's up, Talisha? The Progressive Queens. Check out their YouTube channel as well if you ever get a chance. Uh, where else did I? LSD. I like where your mind is going, LSD. Gregory Young. Luke Mon Nation. Thank you so much, Jackie Luke Mon. Y'all be sure to check out Jackie Luke Mon show as well. Janet Santos, John Custer, Jeffrey Duke, and Christopher Garrett. Thank you all so much for being patrons. We appreciate it because we are broke. <laughs> um, well, even if we're not quite broke, we could be quickly approaching broke. Who can really say? Uh, counting on the state of Maryland to get their unemployment shit together. You know how that goes. So listen, any support that you give, we certainly appreciate it. You sitting here watching is support. So thank you very much uh, for, for, for tuning into the program. We will see y'all on Tuesday for the next edition of Burn It Down with Kim Brown. Thank you so much to Tudeo Gufalaju, Jean Viev, Montanar, and Malé Shaw. And of course, our guest today, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo and Taya Graham and Stephen Janice. Listen, COVID is still out here jumping on people. Don't let the uh, motherfucking CDC tell you anything different. This variance is is bad. J January was the deadliest month for COVID. So all this reopen restaurants and reopen school shit, make it make fucking sense. Okay. But in the interim, please keep yourself safe, social distance, wear your mask, wash your hands. COVID is out here jumping on people. I do not want it to jump on you. Thank y'all for watching the program. We'll see y'all next week. See y'all later. Bye. Bye.